Welcome back, everyone. Today we begin our discussion about maneuvering in space. In the last chapter, we learned about orbits and how spacecraft fall around Earth. In this chapter, we'll learn about the track that a spacecraft in orbit makes on the ground and how to move spacecraft around in space from one orbit to another. In this lesson, we'll discuss spacecraft ground tracks and how we find out where the spacecraft is located. We've learned how spacecraft move through space, but when you think about it, in order to accomplish the spacecraft's mission, we have to know where it's located and where it's going. Often we need to know which part of Earth the spacecraft is over so we can take pictures or communicate. Of course our spacecraft is falling around in orbit at tremendous velocity, and believe it or not, our Earth is rotating on its axis once per day. So the question is, which part of Earth is the spacecraft flying over now? Today we're going to figure this out. Once we know where our spacecraft is located in orbit and on the ground, we'll see next time that we can actually meet another spacecraft in orbit and do a rendezvous. Here you see the Space Shuttle Orbiter docked, or attached, to Hubble Space Telescope. First, we need to understand the fundamentals of spacecraft ground tracks. You might ask yourself why you have to track the spacecraft. Well, let's say you planned a road trip from Omaha, Nebraska to the San Francisco Planetarium. If you're smart, you'll bring along a map with landmarks and coordinates, and you'd also leave your planned route with a friend just in case. If everything goes right, you'll use your map, track your progress, follow the landmarks, visit the planetarium, and return home safely. If anything goes wrong, your friend would know where to look for you based on the time you left, how fast you might be driving, where you might go from one highway to another, and what your final destination was. So let's see how this translates to a spacecraft and its mission. In the figure, you can see the ground track your car made as it traveled over the surface of the Earth. Now, if you flew an airplane from Omaha to the San Francisco Planetarium, chances are you'd be able to fly in a straight line from one point to the other. The airplane wouldn't need roads, so it could use an as-the-crow-flies route, which would result in the airplane ground track shown. A spacecraft is just a little higher above the ground, but we'll learn that spacecraft have ground tracks too. You might be aware that the Earth rotates on its axis, making one complete revolution once per day. When our spacecraft is falling around Earth, the Earth is rotating, so we have a tough problem trying to figure out which part of Earth the spacecraft is flying over. We're going to look at this using a simple, non-rotating Earth example first, and then add Earth's rotation. Then we'll look at some basic types of orbits. A spacecraft's ground track is a trace of the spacecraft's path over Earth's surface. Studying ground tracks has two main purposes. The first is that by knowing the ground tracks of a satellite, we can show what a satellite in orbit can cover on the ground. And second, given a ground track, we can determine what kind of orbit a satellite is following. Okay, let's get started with the non-rotating Earth. All circular orbits around Earth are great circles. Great circles are called great because they must go through the center of the Earth. An ideal Earth is a perfect sphere centered on the point inside the Earth, the perfect center of the Earth. Imagine that a spacecraft has one end of a string attached to it and the other end attached to the center of the Earth. Close your eyes for a second and try to imagine that the string attached to the center of Earth and the spacecraft carves out a line on the surface of Earth. This is a ground track. A great circle is any circle that slices through the center of a sphere, in our case the Earth. In this diagram, you can see two types of circles, those created by lines of latitude that are parallel to Earth's equator but do not include the center of the Earth, and lines of longitude, which are perpendicular to the equator and go through the center of the Earth. So, which circles are great circles, lines of latitude or lines of longitude? Right. Lines of latitude are not great circles because they do not go through the center of the Earth. Lines of longitude are great circles because they go through or include the center of Earth. All Earth orbits are great circles because they include the center of the Earth. Let's take another look at great circles. Lines of longitude, as shown on the left, are great circles because they slice through Earth's center. Imagine that Earth is an orange, 
After peeling the orange, you can see the orange sections are held together by a whitish fiber. You can compare these two lines of longitude. If you remove one orange section, you can see that they touched the center of the orange. Here you see the Greenwich Meridian, or line of longitude, which represents zero longitude. You can also see directions north, south, east, and west. On the right, you can see lines of latitude that are not great circles because they don't include the center of the Earth. Think about the orange we discussed before. Lines of latitude could be created by slicing the orange from top to bottom, perpendicular to the normal sections as shown on the right. Here you can see the equator, which is one unique latitude. What makes the equator a unique line of latitude? The equator is the only line of latitude that includes the center of the Earth. So it's the only line of latitude that is a great circle. So now you understand that any orbit around Earth must be a great circle because the spacecraft is in orbit around Earth's center. Thus, the orbit plane passes through Earth's center. After that great discussion, it's time for a soda. A soda can, that is. Imagine that the Earth is not spherical, but is shaped like a soda can, shown here on top. The black circle around the middle of the can represents the equator. The larger circle is the orbit around the Earth. The blue area within the circle represents the orbit plane. From our previous discussion, what do we know about this orbit plane? Right, it must go through the center of the Earth, or can, in this example. If we draw a line on the soda can directly below the orbit, we'd get a ground track. Another way to think about this is if we tied one end of a string to the imaginary center of the can and the other end to the spacecraft in orbit, the string would carve out a line on the surface of the Earth as the spacecraft travels around in orbit. This line is the spacecraft ground track and represents the point directly under the spacecraft. Now we'll cut the soda can in half and flatten it to reveal the ground track as shown in the bottom figure. Notice that the ground track of the spacecraft forms a nice symmetrical wave around the equator. Wow, that's not so hard. After class, why don't you go get a soda and think about it? Let's get down to Earth by assuming that the Earth is not rotating. Now we've turned the soda can into a non-rotating Earth, shown on the left while the orbit in red remains the same. When we flatten the Earth onto a flat mat projection, the ground track looks about the same as it did with our soda can example. This shape always looks similar to four circular orbits. The red dot on the orbit ground track in the center of the figure on the right represents the point where the spacecraft crosses the equator northbound. If you look closely, you'll notice the orbit ground track extends up and down an equal amount in latitude. That is, the highest latitude the ground track reaches north of the equator equals the lowest latitude reached south of the equator. With the ideal non-rotating Earth, each time the spacecraft goes around the orbit, it covers all longitudes, or 360 degrees, and ends up at the same place orbit after orbit. The ground track is exactly the same after each orbit for the non-rotating Earth. What do you think would change if we let Earth rotate? We'll see about this in a few minutes. The characteristic curved shape of ground tracks occurs because of the orbit's inclination, which, in certain cases, equals the highest latitude the ground track attains. Now that we know what a non-rotating Earth ground track looks like, we're going to let Earth rotate and see what changes. Here the orbit is red, and it's a great circle as before. We've added the spacecraft to the orbit, and you can see the direction it will travel. The spacecraft will complete one low Earth orbit in about 90 minutes. It will complete about 16 orbits in one day, about 24 hours. This orbit is similar to those of the Space Shuttle and the International Space Station. Note that the Earth rotates once per day, or 360 degrees in 24 hours. This means that the Earth rotates about its axis at a rate of about 15 degrees per hour. This fact was used to create time zones around the Earth. In the winter, if you lived in California, you'd be using Pacific Standard Time, or PST. If you lived in Colorado, you'd be on Mountain Standard Time, or MST.
If it were 8 a.m. MST in Colorado, what time would it be in California? Well, it would be one hour earlier, or 7 a.m. This is true because the Earth rotates from west to east, meaning that folks in Colorado would see the sunrise about an hour before the people in California. Now we can put the concepts we've talked about so far together to see how an orbit's ground track changes over time, primarily due to Earth's rotation. A typical low Earth orbit is shown on the left in red. You can see the rotating Earth and the orbit that the spacecraft follows in red. Ideally, this orbit does not move. It remains stationary in space. Imagine that you are standing on the South American continent as shown. On the right, you can see the flat Earth projection that we talked about before. You can also see the ground track of the first orbit shown in red. But what happened with the second, or blue, orbit? Since the orbit plane shown on the left remained stationary and the Earth rotated west to east, the second, or blue, ground track has shifted to the west. What do you think will happen on the third orbit? Right, it will move to the west. If you were standing on the South American continent as shown, you would see a spacecraft in the first orbit go overhead to the east, and you'd see the same spacecraft go overhead to the west on the second orbit. Note that the curved path, or ground track shown in red, does not cover 360 degrees of longitude as it did on the non-rotating Earth. So, ground tracks for spacecraft in low Earth circular orbits tend to look like smooth curves or sine waves if you've had trigonometry. Generally, for spacecraft in direct circular orbits like the one shown, ground tracks will shift to the west. Let's look at a slightly different case that's very practical and useful. The orbit and ground track we discussed on the last slide was a low Earth orbit with a period of 1.5 hours. This means that the spacecraft takes 1.5 hours to make one complete revolution in its orbit. Now let's look at a few more orbits to make sure you understand the concept. Each of the orbits shown, A through E, are circular orbits. Orbits A through C have increasing periods, P, on the chart, ranging from 2 and 1 half hours for A to 18 hours for orbit C. You should note that as the periods get longer, the ground track becomes more scrunched along the equator. Also, orbits A through D have the same inclination or tilt based on the highest latitude attained. If they were at different inclinations, the highest latitude reached would be different. We'll talk about the differences between orbit D and E in just a minute, but note that they both have periods of 24 hours. What does this mean? You're right. It means that it takes a spacecraft in these orbits 24 hours to complete one revolution. It turns out that over half of the 550 operational spacecraft in orbit are in these 24-hour period orbits. These are very useful orbits that have their spacecraft orbiting Earth at the same rate that Earth rotates. Orbit D is a geosynchronous orbit, meaning it is in sync with the Earth. It has a 24-hour period and it has an inclination different than zero as shown. Orbit E is a very special geostationary orbit, meaning it is also in sync with the Earth, having a 24-hour period. But a geostationary orbit is very special because it has zero or no inclination. It is in an equatorial orbit and its great circle is in the same plane as the equator of the Earth. It appears to be a dot on the equator. Let's take a few more minutes and discuss geosynchronous and geostationary orbits in a little more detail. The circular geosynchronous orbit on the left has a 24-hour period, but it also is an inclined orbit so it can see more of Earth. It has the characteristic figure 8 shape. The ground track for the spacecraft in geostationary orbit on the right looks like a dot on the equator. That's because the spacecraft is falling around Earth above the equator at the same rate Earth is rotating. Geostationary orbits are circular, with a period of about 24 hours and an inclination or tilt of zero degrees. This results in a point ground track which is particularly useful for communication satellites. Can you think why that is? It's because a spacecraft in geostationary orbit appears motionless to an Earth-based observer. If you have satellite TV in school or at home, you'll notice that the satellite dish does not move. It's pointed to a spacecraft in geostationary orbit. Now here's some information you can actually use. 
Hikers will tell you that if you need to get your directional bearings in a forest, look for the side of the tree that has moss growing on it. That direction is often north, where the tree gets the least amount of sun. If, on the other hand, you're lost in a city and need to get your direction straight, what can you do? You can use a satellite dish to tell you where south is. Yes, in the U.S., all of our satellite TV dishes point south to spacecraft located in geostationary orbit. Of course, geosynchronous and geostationary orbits are useful for many other applications, like weather, military early warning, and remote sensing, because spacecraft in these orbits are able to see wide areas and even entire continents from their vantage points. Okay, I think we're ready to move on to the activity. Take a look at these questions and answer them based on the material we've just learned. Remember that if you have any trouble, go over the material again or ask your teacher for help. In the orbits demonstration we're about to watch, you'll get to see several different types of orbits. Some of them you've seen, others are provided to help you expand your understanding. The largest white orbit in the plane of the equator is geosynchronous. The mid-altitude red orbit is for the Global Positioning System, or GPS. It has a 12-hour period. The pink elliptical orbit is a Russian orbit called Molnia. There are several low Earth orbits as well. After a few minutes, you'll get a closer view of the spacecraft, and you'll see a field of view cone emanating from the spacecraft with a ground spot on the Earth that represents what the simulated spacecraft could see on the ground. Then you'll get a very close view of the spacecraft in orbit. Note that LEO means Low Earth Orbit, GPS means Global Positioning System, and SSO means Sun Synchronous Orbit. As you can imagine, it's really a challenge to make all of these spacecraft work together to conduct NASA and DOD operations. By the way, this QuickTime video was provided by Analytical Graphics Incorporated and Teaching Science and Technology Incorporated. We've just covered the basics of ground tracks and how the spacecraft in orbit creates a ground track on the Earth. We know how the orbit ground tracks look on a non-rotating and a rotating Earth. We've also seen several types of low Earth and higher circular orbits, including geosynchronous and geostationary orbits. You should look at the photo in this slide of a dish-shaped antenna in northern Sweden, which is waiting to track the MAXIS-4 launch for the European Space Agency. The antenna will follow the sounding rocket automatically as it lifts off with a 15G acceleration, which is far too fast for manually operated equipment to follow. We've learned the basics of ground tracks and the two different orbit types, geosynchronous and geostationary. Now, let's look at why and how we get a spacecraft from its initial to its final mission orbit and between orbits during its mission. 